here we have this program. And first, let's have a look at the elements that occur in this program. First, we have the atoms. A, B, and A also appears here, and B also appears here. So in this case, the atoms are just letters, but in general, they can have more elaborated structure. So they can be words like good, bad, sunny, and even something more complicated. For example, in timetabling, we can have an atom that represents that the course on computer science is assigned on Mondays to the first slot. Or in the problem of semester planning, we could have another atom that says that ASP is selected for the next semester, for example. And as we will see in a moment, answer sets are just sets of these atoms. So the atoms are the fundamental elements and the answer sets are just sets of them. And then answer set programming can be simply seen as a language to talk about sets, where the sets are composed of atoms. Good, let's move on. Then we have literals. So A, B, and not B are literals. Basically, literals are atoms like A and B or the negation. This not is the symbol we will be using for negating something. So here at the A, we can read it as a condition on whether A is in an answer set. So this not B can be read as saying B is not in the answer set. Then we have one rule, a second rule, and a third rule here. And the first one is called a choice rule because it allows us to do a choice on A. This can be read as follows. A may be in an answer set, or we may add A to an answer set. And it's a rule that allows us to choose whether we add A or not to an answer set. That's why it's called a choice rule. Then we have normal rules like this one here that says that if A is in an answer set, then B must also be in an answer set. So the choice rule was saying that A may be in an answer set, but this normal rule tells us that if this condition holds, if A is in an answer set, then B must be in an answer set. Or if A is in an answer set, we must add B to that answer set. And well, we can also, here I was reading it from right to left, we can also read it from left to right and saying that B must be in an answer set if A is in an answer set, right? And you can read this symbol, the column plus the minus, as an if in natural length. Good, let's move on to the third rule, which is a constrained rule, because it constrains the answer sets that we may have. And this can be read as follows. It cannot be the case, and this is how we can read this here when there is nothing to its left. We can read it as, if it, if it is not the case, sorry, it cannot be the case that B is not in an answer set. Or another way, delete an answer set if B is not in it. Okay, this is the, you see here the difference is that there is nothing here to the left of it. And yeah, here I was talking about what is to the left of it. So what is to on the left of the rules is called the head of the rules. And what is on the right of the rules is called the body of the rule. So the constrained rules do not have a head and in this case, this choice rule doesn't have a body. Good. And then the three rules together form a program. But also if we just had this rule, this would also be a program with a single rule. And if we had just these two, this would also be another program. A program is interpreted actually as a set of these rules that we have seen. So this means if it's a set, that it doesn't matter the order in which we write the rules. So for this, it doesn't matter whether we put the choice rule on A here in between or in the first place or in the third one. The answer sets of the program will be the same. And this will see it now in a second. So let's go to it and see what are the answer sets of this program. And we can do this incrementally. We start with an empty set with a set where there's nothing inside 
and this is represented by this circle here that has nothing inside. And then we apply the choice rule on A that tells us we may add A to our answer set. Then after applying the rule, we have two options. Either we have not added the A and then we still have the empty set, or we have taken the option and added A to the set. Then we are here with these two sets that we have built so far. Then we can apply the rule that says that if A is in the set, then B must be in the set. Then when we apply it to this set that contains the A, since A is in the set, we must add the B, right? And then we arrive to this new set AB. While here, if we apply the rule to this set, since A is not there, there's nothing to do. And the, the same set, this empty set, is there after applying the rule B if A. So then after applying these two rules, we have these two sets, the empty one and the AB. Now, if we apply this constraint that tells us it cannot be the case that B is not in the set, then suddenly this set disappears because B is not in the set. The constraint is telling us that this cannot be the case, then this disappears from here. While for this set, nothing happens. It survives because B is indeed in the set. So the constraint does not eliminate it. And this is what we have after applying the rule. And overall, after applying the three rules, we end up only with the set that contains A and B. Now, if we look at the way we have applied the rules, you can see that we have applied them in order. And now I give you maybe a few seconds and maybe you want to stop the video to think about it. Why do I say that I have applied the rules in order? So I wait two seconds and you may want to stop the video. Okay, the idea is that this first choice rule does not depend on anything. It just says you may choose A. So then I can apply it basically whenever I want. But the second rule is telling me that I must add B if A is in the set. So then it makes sense to apply this rule after I have applied all the rules where A occurs in the head, which in, the, in, in this case, this is the only one where A occurs in the head. So I've applied this rule in order because before applying it, I have applied all the rules where A occurs in the head. In this case, this was the unique such rule. Now, this rule, we also have, it, have applied it in order because all the rules where B occurs in the head, in this case, just this one, have been applied before. Or put another way, there are, once we apply this rule, there are no rules left where B occurs in the head. And similarly, thing, we can say something like this here. Once we apply these rules, there are no rules left to apply where A occurs in the head. Then it is in order. And then we reach to the point where we can say, OK, since we have applied all the rules in order, then this is the unique answer set of this program. And the, because an answer set is the result of applying the rules of a program in order. And as we will see, we will have to adapt it a bit when the program has recursion, but we will see this later. For now, this is the idea that you have to keep in mind that the answer sets of a logic program are the result of applying the rules in order. And yes, then basically what the logic program does is it defines a set of sets. In this case, we just have one set with A, B, but we could have maybe no answer set or many answer sets. And we will see examples of this later. And for this is from this perspective, answer set programming is a language to talk about sets because every logic program will have some sets associated with it that we will call answer sets. And when we model a program when we, sorry, when we model a problem to solve a given problem, then the answer sets will correspond to the solutions to our problem. So in this case, maybe when we get that the answer set is AB, 
we can say, okay, then what we have to do is we have to do A and we have to do B, assuming that A and B represent some actions that we could do. Or if you think about timetabling, our answer sets will have atoms of the form um, assign some cost to some time slot someday. And then when we look into the answer set, we will see these atoms. And just looking at these atoms, we will know what is a good timetabling for our course. Or with semester planning, when we look inside the answer set, instead of having this AB, we will have some atoms saying select ASP or select philosophy or select mathematics or whatever. And looking at those atoms that occur in the answer set, we can know what is a solution to our problem, right? Good, and then, so this was about how to understand logic programs, and we will be doing more examples on this. Then the next thing I said that ECASP brings us is a very simple tip, a very simple methodology for programming, which is just to tell us, look, then just write the rules in order for two reasons. First, because then it's very easy to understand the program. Right? Because the answer sets of the program are just the result of applying the rules in the way you have written them, if you have written them in order. Again, as I said before, for the system, it doesn't matter in which order you write the rules in your file. So basically, what I want to represent here with this, is with this rectangle is that the, these rules will occur in a file named example1.lp. And we put them in order. This is what we recommend. In, in this methodology that you do it like this because then it's easy to understand and the second reason for this is that it's actually more natural right you can think of a logic program as a kind of recipe for building sets and then if you are giving a recipe it makes sense that you do it in the proper order no first i tell you when under which condition should i add a to the set and i only tell you about b once i have told you about a if a if uh, B depends on A, right? And similarly with the, with the constraint, if there's some constraint on whether B occurs or not in the set, it makes to sense to tell you this constraint only after I have told you which are the conditions for adding B to the set, right? And yes, and also if you think of a logic program as a description of the sets, as a description of its answer sets, then it also makes sense to write it in order, because when you are describing something, you typically go also in order. First, I tell you about the A, and then if B depends on the A, I do it afterwards. So this is also a natural way to tell a story. This is a natural way to describe a set. And often in books and movies, you may have some flashbacks and that, but, but if you want to be clear and precise, it's better to go in the natural order. Good. Then let's see now quickly one example of what would happen if we do not apply the rules in order. Again, we start incrementally with the empty set. And if we apply the rule B if A, then nothing happens because A is not in the set, then we do not have to add the B. Now, if we apply the constraint that tells us it cannot be the case that B is not in the set, since B is not in the set, the set is deleted. And now the choice on A has nothing to do because it, it, can't, it cannot inherit force from anything. So we end up having no solution. Now we have applied the rules like this, but this is not in order because this rule has been applied before we have applied the rules that have A in the head. In particular, it has been applied before applying this rule. Hence, this is not in order. And then the result that we have is not valid. We will not care about this. We will only care about applying the rules in order because the answer sets of a program are the result of applying the rules in order. And then we will uh, qualify a bit this definition once we move to, once we see some programs with recursion. But this is the basic idea and the, the ground for this very simple methodology. 